uh, let's start with just remind ourselves of the, um, the motto and the vision for 2020. So let's all read this together. Let us become true owners of the heavenly kingdom who practice true love in resemblance to our creator, the heavenly parent. So um, we put uh, little yellow reminders for you. Uh, a couple of weeks ago we passed out one that had a little bit different translation, but this is the translation that we're going with. So um, something to stick in your wallets and, and take with you. On the back it actually has the Korean. So we know um, our founder, Mother Moon, would love if you could also repeat that, had that memorized in Korean too. So something, a challenge for us to work on. Uh, <clears throat> this week uh, I was look at the sermon, uh, the topic is uh, we are not alone. So I was thinking about talking about uh, aliens and life on other planets, but um, I decided instead I would talk about more the feeling of being alone and loneliness. So um, I read uh, a story about um, uh, a young man, he was feeling pretty lonely in his life, and so figured, well, you know, wh what can I do to, to solve this loneliness problem? So he figured it out. He said, I'll get a pet. I'll get a pet, and, and then with my pet, I will no longer be lonely. So he goes to a pet store, but he said, I, you know, I don't want just a regular pet. I don't want just a dog or a cat or something. So what kind of pet can I get? So he's talking to the store owner, the pet store owner, and, and eventually the pet store owner, well, you know, I got a really amazing centipede. So he said, a centipede, wow. I bet nobody else has a pet centipede. Just me. So, he bought this pet centipede, took it home, you know. He was quite happy with it, you know, talking to it all the time, this and that. And then uh, in the afternoon, he said, well, you know, um, I can go out and get, get a hamburger. So, he asked the pet centipede, hey, you want to come with me? I'm going to go get a hamburger. He didn't get any response. Uh, so then, you know, well, he, he asked, it, I'm going to go get a hamburger. Do you want to come with me? You know, and... You know, still no response. Well, he, he goes and he puts his jacket on and he comes back over and he peeks down inside the, the, the cage, you know, and he says, I'm going to get a hamburger. Do you want to go with me? And the centipede looks at him and says, Hold on, I'm still putting on my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, centipedes have a hundred feet, right? So that's a lot of shoes to put on when you want to go out. <laughs> Uh, actually, while I, while I was doing that studying, um, in addition to finding that interesting story, uh, I found a lot of uh, information about um, loneliness. And actually, uh, this comes from a, a social relations and mortality um, research study that was done uh, uh, by um, Brigham Young University uh, back in, I think, a couple of years ago. And they, what they did was they looked at over 300,000 um, uh, situations of, of people. They looked at studies that have been done, like maybe 30 or 40 different studies, and they brought them all together to do a, run an analysis of it. And they were looking at loneliness and you know, social relations and how that affects our life and our health and our well-being. And they found that when they compared loneliness, people that reported that they were socially isolated or felt lonely, that it would actually, you could predict which people were more likely to die earlier, uh, more frequently, even if you compared it with other things. Like, so what are some of the other factors that usually cause an early death? Heart like attack. Heart attack, or, or uh, people smoking, Cancer. or people um, uh, drinking a lot, stuff like that. Well, they found that loneliness could effectively predict how early people would die same as alcoholism or people that smoke 15 packs of cigarettes a day. 15 you know, cigarettes. 15 cigarettes a day. Same <laughs> level, same level of, of you know, it, that's interesting, you know, that people actually die of loneliness. It contributes to people's poor health and lack of loneliness. In addition to that, there's other factors, you know, like to talk about people being overweight or, or um, or maybe not getting around, maybe sitting in front of the TV or the computer too long. You know, that, those are also strong predictors. Well, loneliness is a higher, more uh, accurate predictor that someone's not going to live so long than if, they just, if, they, if they're overweight or if they don't get around and no exercise. So loneliness is actually something not insignificant in our lives. Um, this is from um, uh, a director of this uh, Center for... Uh, in Chicago, Chicago University. And he did a research and, and found out 
that the rate of loneliness in America has doubled from 20% in the 1980s to 40% of people in 2010 report feeling lonely, being lonely. And, um, you know, that's, of course, our technology has been a, a big part of that, you know. You, you can get so much satisfaction from talking to someone on your Facebook, you know, how many friends do you have? Well, I don't know how much that satisfies our craving for real human interaction. In the study, he also wrote, loneliness, I'm just reading from him, loneliness is the feeling of social isolation or dissatisfaction with your relationships. It's not just about whether others are around you. It's whether the ones around you are those that you can trust. So we know that uh, it, you know, loneliness, there's a difference between lonely and being alone. Because actually being alone and solitude actually sometimes is quite nice and quite healthy and quite good for us. But the feeling of loneliness is, is really um, a feeling of that we're, we're uh, rejected or alienated or separated from other people. Um, closely related to a feeling of lack of love. You know, not, not being loved or, or feeling unloved or uncared for. Also, um, the fact that feeling nobody cares about me. Poor me. <laughs> nobody cares about me. All these things are... Um, you know, the descriptors of, uh, of loneliness. So, if we think about it, loneliness can make us do bad things. Uh, peer pressure is one of the powerful sources. You know, I don't want to be different than everyone else. I want to be accepted. I want to be loved by others. So, peer pressure works using that, that power to get us to do sometimes, you know, things that we wouldn't want, normally want to do. You know, you're in school and everybody else is doing something that you know you don't really want to do. But because everyone else is doing it, you don't want to be rejected, you want to be part of it. And, you know, each of us feels a little bit of a lack of love. You know, I, I want to feel love. I want to feel accepted. I want to be part of this. And so it can motivate us to do things that maybe we, we really wouldn't want to do if we were making a clear choice. So the important thing in dealing with that is we need to get grounded in feeling loved ourselves. Because the core of our life, the reason that this loneliness effect happens is because we are designed to be in relationships with people. We are designed to be with others. It's the way God made us, is to be with others. So remember, I'm going to have you practice this again. What does everybody want? Joy. Joy. And how do we get it? True love. We get it through the true loving relationships. Meaning giving and uh, living for the benefit of others. Making a positive difference in other people's lives and having other people making a positive difference in our lives. Well, the challenge is, especially in this kind of world where we have a uh, you know, uh, different standard, uh, especially as church members, than people in the world, it's easy to feel isolated, to feel separated uh, from others. Um, but it, we have a long tradition of that. Actually, when we look at the, the, the Old Testament and some of the biblical figures, uh, there are some people who had some pretty serious loneliness problems. You know, isolation, rejected by people. Uh, if you think about Noah, I think there's a movie coming out soon, right? But Noah probably didn't have a whole lot of friends, right? He's out there building this ark on the top of a mountain. And everyone's going, you're crazy. <laughs> this guy is really crazy. How do you persevere in something like that? You know, all of God's champions often had to persevere in the face of being rejected, being persecuted, being made fun of, and all kinds of difficulty. Uh, even Abraham, uh, he actually, uh, God called him to leave his family uh, of idol worshipers and, and who made idols and like that to take off. And, you know, out on his own. And if you look at the, all through the course of Abraham's life, sometimes he was in situations where you know, he was likely to be killed. People were rejecting him. Uh, even in, in Abraham's family, Jacob, uh, he actually had a huge conflict with his brother. You know, that love relationship. And he had to run away and live with an uncle, Uncle Laban, right, who was really mean to him, <laughs> really gave him a hard time, cheated him over and over again. Uh, and yet he, he had to persevere. Uh, Joseph, Jacob's son, you know, you know the story of Joseph and the amazing Technicolor dream coat? Um, his brothers rejected him, right? They, they sold him off into slavery. And, 
He, he was in, went to Egypt as a slave, and then eventually was even thrown in prison, and all kinds of things. And there's this great song in, uh, that uh, we heard actually a few weeks back you know, from that uh, amazing Technicolor Dream Corp, where he really sings about his connection with God, and that's what gave him strength to persevere. Um, all of the prophets, uh, Moses, Moses was a great complainer. Actually, you can read a lot of his stories. Complains all the time to God. Says, oh, I can't do that because it would be embarrassing because I'm not a good talker. I don't want to be in front of people. And, oh, don't worry, I'll give you your brother. He'll help you out. You know? So all these uh, people and the, and the prophets, if you read many of them, uh, they, they complain a lot. They were rejected by people. They were persecuted. They had a, a horrible time. Even King David, um, you know, the book of Psalms is filled with his poems and poetry. And a lot of it is, is him just complaining to God about, nobody likes me. Nobody loves me. Actually, let's read this. from, from uh, This is from Psalms um, uh, uh, 69. Uh, he writes, For I endure insults for your sake. He's talking to God. Humiliation is written all over my face. Even my own brothers pretend they don't know me. They treat me like a stranger. Passion for your house has consumed me. And the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. I, when I weep and fast, they scoff at me. And when I dress in burlap to show I'm sad, to show sorrow, they make fun of me. You know of my shame, scorn, and disgrace. You see all that all my enemies are doing. Their insults have broken my heart, and I am in despair. If only one person would show me some pity. If only one would turn and comfort me. But instead, they give me poison for food, and they offer me sour wine for my thirst. Ouch. <laughs> so, uh, anybody feel like that last week? <laughs> yeah, you know, sometimes at work, sometimes at school, sometimes at home, sometimes... You know, we have these circumstances and situations in life, especially when we're trying to hold to a higher standard. We're going to be challenged a lot and confronted a lot. But this is the way God designed it. God does not like this situation. God did not create us that way. In fact, God's original intention, His original design for us, was that we would be one human family connected to each other through bonds of true love. Our first connection will be with God. You know, one heart and mind with God. And when we know God is our loving parent, then we know that everybody else around us is our brother and our sister, our family. And God's love is meant to be expressed through those relationships. That's what we want. We all want joy through those loving relationships. We all want to feel lives of fulfillment through the practice of love. But we're not living in that kind of situation. God's ideal was broken and lost due to the fall. So all of human history has been God's work and effort trying to heal that, trying to bring that back. You know, all those people that we named off, you know, that may be really lonely, sad, who's the most lonely of all? It's actually God. Because God lost God's children with the fall. So God understands loneliness even more deeply, more profoundly than, than any of us do. Here's um, from uh, Father Moon's words about uh, Father, God's heart. Can you imagine how profoundly God's heart was broken at the death of Adam, who was to establish an everlasting family and accomplish God's great endeavor of creation? How could he feel that everything had, got, had gone wrong in the way that it did? Even after 6,000 years, you know, 6,000 biblical years, God has not recovered from the shock of Adam and Eve's fall. This is truly one of the most profound understandings from the uh, unification principle and from Father Moon's teachings. is to understand the heart of God. To understand God's intention and design for us, God's love for us, and God's heartbreak that God can't be intimate in every aspect of our lives. So God's original design was that our connection with God would be the foundation for our connections with everyone else. 
So when we're relating to the people around us, we connect easily and comfortably because we have a common base, a common connection of God, our loving Heavenly Parent. Now that, that, that hope uh, has been educated and brought throughout the uh, religious traditions. You know, if we look at Judaism, first was to understand God as our Master, you know, a loving Master, you know, the Lord of creation. And then Jesus brought us to a much higher level of understanding, really relating to God as our Father. And then uh, Father Moon and our true parents have brought and nurtured our understanding that God is our loving parent, our, our Father Mother, God, who loves us and cares us and suffers and grieves at the sadness and the hurt of God's, God's children. Well, Unification Principle talks clearly, and it starts out even in the very beginning chapter, the hope that God has for this world, the ideal that we're all striving for, is a world of true love and true peace. Here's uh, from the Unification Principle. In this vision of the ideal, everyone will adore and serve God as their parent and live in harmony with each other in brotherly love. It is human nature that when people wrong their neighbor for selfish ends, they suffer more from the pangs of conscience than they benefit from the enjoyment of the unrighteous gains. How much more would this be true in a society where people who actually feel that God, who transcends time and space and observes their every act, wants them to love each other? This is what God wants. God wants to be intimately part of our lives, wants to have that loving relationship and to know that we're designed to love each other. We are designed for relationships of love. Well, the point of this sermon, the point of everything, is we are not alone. Even when we, we feel so lonely and heartbroken and hurt by the, the circumstances and the situations that we might be dealing with, we're never alone because God is that loving parent who wants so much to be present in our lives, wants to comfort the children. And what parent doesn't want to make it better for their kids? You know, even though I was talking to my mom about, you know, I'm having kind of a struggle for, for you know, the sermon this week. Now she always, she's filled with advice, you know. Oh, well, how about this? And how about you try this? You know, it's just what we do as parents, right? As parents, we just, we automatically want to give advice. You know, sometimes it doesn't work so well. <laughs> you know, when we talk to uh, uh, my daughter on the phone, you know, we would say, you know, she's, oh, this, this has happened. You know, the first thing that's out of our mouth, oh, yeah, well, you should do this. And we, you know, because we want to fix it. We want to make it better. Why? Because we love. Because we care. So, core to this power in our lives, is the presence of God in our lives. So, what can we do? Um, here, just to emphasize it from 1 John. It says, uh, we know how much God loves us, and we've put our trust in God's love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God. And God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So the key to that is our loving relationship and experience with God. Here's how Father Moon puts it. Love only works when you have a partner. This is the basic rule of the universe. No matter how all-knowing and all-powerful God may be, without a partner, He is a lonely and sad God. So God is lonely and sad. Looking for partners of love. Looking to each one of us. Because we know each of us is unique and can bring joy and comfort to God, our loving Heavenly Parent, in a unique way that uh, we can scratch an itch that only we can scratch. <laughs> There's a part of God that aches to feel that loving relationship that only we can satisfy. So in our lives, how do we deepen that connection with God? The solution to, to loneliness in our life is, is first and foremost is that we make that vertical connection with God, our loving parent. That's the foundation for all of our relationships. That's the foundation for our health. That's the cure for loneliness. So even we're alone, even we're isolated from other people, even we're alienated and rejected by people, we're never alone. 
Because God is always there. The problem is not that God isn't there, is that we are closed to receiving God's love. Our hearts and mind are not open to receiving God, God who's desperately knocking at the door, banging on our lives, saying, please, please let me in. I love you. I love you. I care for you. Please let me be part of your life. How do we do that? The first thing we have to do is we have to invite God's presence into our lives. We need to make a, a, a conscious decision and invite God, not just, I mean, the beginning when we invite Christ into our life, you know, and we and, and reborn, but that's just the beginning. We're inviting God to be part of our lives all the time. Not just when I come to church, okay, God, I'm going to church, please come with us. No, when we're going to the movie, when we're doing anything we enjoy, when we're living our lives, let's invite God consciously to be part of our lives. Let's open our hearts and minds to feel God's presence every, all the time, at any time. Now, if you think, when I, I look to find joy in my life, what am I doing? Well, any place that brings me joy, I want God to be there. I want to share that. Right? I want to share that with God, my loving Heavenly Parent, who cares about us. But by God's own principle, God does not intervene in our lives without our invitation. Without us opening the door, God can't come. No matter how desperate God is, and God is very desperate to, to, to embrace the children, but because we keep the door closed, God can't come. So first we need to open up our hearts to invite God's presence. And then we need to communicate. This is our prayer life, our time of prayer. It's not just, okay, uh, good morning, uh, God, our Heavenly Parent. Let's have a great day today. Amen. Adieu, let's go. <laughs> and uh, time, for, time for dinner. Okay. Thank you for the food. Amen. <laughs> but those are important because it's, it's, it reminds us all the time that God's part of our lives. But investing in quality time with God. You know, we, the, the expression we use all the time, you know, let's commit some quality time with God, our loving Heavenly Parent, every day. You know, how about if, if I come home every day and, and, you know, and you know, the person you know, I love most, the closest to me in, in, in my life, in this physical world, is my wife. You know? So suppose I come home and I go, oh, hi, honey, and then I go off and <laughs> do my thing, right? You know? It's like, sometimes we treat God that way. Don't Hi, God. <laughs> Hope you're still there taking care of me. <laughs> Talk to you later. <laughs> you know, sometimes our kids do that to us, right? <laughs> we love them so much and we care so much about them. And they're kind of like, okay, fine, fine, thanks. <laughs> but God is that loving parent who's always there and always trying to reach out to us. But we have to open up and we have to invest time. So, you know, we all probably have a favorite thing, you know, you come home from work or, or from school or whatever, and you've got that thing that you really want to do. You know, maybe, oh, you know, there's this game, and I'm on, I'm on level 17, I've got to break through level 18, or, or this, that soap opera that I'm watching, what's the next episode going to happen, or that TV show, or, or reading a book, you know, I want, what's the next chapter? You know, there's all these things that we have in our life that we really enjoy, you know, that get, gets us going. Well, you know, one of those things should be time with God. We should actually look forward. Oh, I have my time, my quiet time now. I can sit my quiet time in, under, under my tree in the backyard. You know, I have a tiny backyard. We have a little strip of grass. But there's a tree, you know. I can sit underneath my tree and look up at the stars, you know. That quality time that we invest with God and communicate and share and commune. This nurtures God's presence in us. When we invest in that kind of quality time, when we invest in our relationship that way, then that presence becomes more real, more substantial in our lives. But it takes our investments, our communication, our investing time in the things that are important to us. You know, I make it, oh, I make it a condition, I'm going to pray. Well, yeah, okay, that's good. Let's do our duty and make those conditions. But our time with God should also be that thing I'm looking forward to. 
just as much as that soap opera next episode, you know, <laughs> the cliffhanger, I want to find out what happened, you know. We should be anxious to, to have that quality time with God. So, inviting God in, spending quality time with God, and then study. You know, the Unificationists were definitely a study church, right? Let's study every day, the Korean term, hundake, right? For every day, we get up, we study, gather and study. Because we need to be continually growing in our understanding of God. This is why reading the scripture and filling our minds with, with heavenly perspective is so important. To see, to understand God more deeply is when we study and we see how God revealed uh, God's love and heart throughout history, particularly we look at biblical history or, or we, we, scriptures. We can feel and grow in our intellectual understanding about God's love through our investment of study. And that's something that we have to invest time in. We need to commit ourselves to. <clears throat> in addition to fighting God in, spending time with God and studying about God's word and God's truth, we need be, to be people of action. This is where God really likes to be with us. Really finds joy in our activities and our actions, especially when we do things that create a common base with God. And when we do actions of goodness you know, for the benefit of others or, or making a positive change in the environment around us, God gets so excited. God is so happy to be there with us. So we should look at what we do in our lives. You know, uh, The actions, the things that we do. Am I making God happy? Is God happy to be hanging out with me right now? Is God finding joy with what I'm doing? Look at our lives. You know, this can serve as a, as, as a guidepost to us in terms of what's healthy, what's, where am I going to grow the most? You know, is God happy to be there with me? Am I inviting God? Am I opening my heart to God's presence in all these circumstances? And then finally, when you have something that's really great, something that you really enjoy, like that movie or that song or the, the soap opera or the book or, or anything, what do we like to do? When you find something great, what do you want to do? You want to share it. You want to share it. God's love, the great thing about love, you know, sometimes you feel, oh, you know, I've only got this much love. If I give any love away, I'll run out. I don't want to run out. I got I to gotta keep getting it in. The truth is, you know, if you have this big pile of love and you just keep putting love in. Well, here, here, here's an exercise I saw Reverend Thompson do the other week. Okay. So it's a meditation exercise. Okay, so everybody sit up straight. Sit up straight. Okay, you can keep your eyes open, but if you want, you can close your eyes. Okay, now take in a deep breath and hold it. Breathe in a little bit more. Good. Keep holding it. Breathe in a little bit more. Good. Keep holding it. Uh, that doesn't work, does it? <laughs> it's got to, whatever comes in, it's also got to come out, right? <laughs> so, with love, love actually grows. You know, you know the power of give and take? When love comes in, and when you, it, it goes out as well, actually it becomes more healthy, more vital, and it grows. So, we need to share God's love. You know, through our actions, through our activities, through the uh, educating, teaching, sharing insights about God, we need to help the world understand more deeply God's heart so that people can find joy in their relationship with God. So people can find fulfillment in their lives. We have so much to share. Oh, I'm just, I'm studying, I'm studying, I'm becoming so smart. So what if I'm so smart? <laughs> if I don't, number one, apply it to my actions, but number two, share it with others. So others also can experience that joy and happiness. This is why you know we're all called to witness. You know, and there's different ways that we witness. But honestly, being a genuine person who shares the great experience and knowledge that we have, we have something precious and wonderful we want to share with people. Let's be people who share and give. This is where we're going to deepen that connection with God. Find that base, that solidarity. This is how those Old Testament figures and these prophets who suffered incredible persecution could survive. It's because of their connection with God, our Heavenly Parent. We nurture that connection. Invite God in first and foremost. 
pray, spend quality time in communication with God. Uh, study, enrich our understanding of God's work and God's providence. Take actions of love to make a difference in the world around us and share this precious truth. This is where God becomes a solid rock in our lives. And as we go out, we can be a benefit, a positive influence in the world around us. I want to conclude with a, a couple of verses. This is from the New Testament, from again, 1 John. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. I love that word, lavished. God's lavished His love on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. We need to remember that. And we need to share that. And here, from Father Moon. If you have something you consider most precious, you will want to carry it with you at all times. You will not want to be separated from it, even for a moment. Then if God, the greatest treasure of them all, was in your possession, where would you like to attend Him? Is there a storeroom where you could store Him? Let's put Him over here in the cubby hole. <laughs> Keep Him secure where you can attend Him. Actually, that place is none other than your heart and mind. The human heart and mind form the storeroom where God can be safely attended. So let's open up our hearts. Let, let that presence of God and God's love genuinely dwell in us and be people who can shine that, share that, and spread that everywhere we go. It's important that we always remember and know we are never alone. God, our loving Heavenly Parent, is always there with us, nurturing and encouraging our biggest champion and hero to encourage us to go forward. That is God, <laughs> our Heavenly Parent. Please join me in prayer. <clears throat> Father, Mother, God, our, our loving Heavenly Parent, we know that you ache so much to be deeply embedded in our hearts and in our minds, to be at the core of our being so that your love and your presence can heal any hurt that we encounter, heal any struggle or challenge, and bring hope and vision to all of the circumstances of our lives. Heavenly Parent, thank you so much for your love, for your precious love. And again, Heavenly Parent, we come before you as your children, grateful for that love, determined to open up our hearts and each one of us as we come to you we open our hearts again anew afresh each day to receive your precious love to attend you completely in all things that we do thank you thank you for never giving up on us even we repent for so many times when we've closed our hearts but again we're determining now to open them up and as soon as we see our hearts closed, we, we'll open them up again. Heavenly Parent, we want to dwell with you consistently in all of our activities and everything we do. We pray you can find joy and you can find ho uh, hope and comfort. We love you so much and we thank you for your love. As your sons and daughters and as blessed sense of families, we offer this time, this prayer to you. Amen and adieu. We're not alone, right? right? Okay, thank you. Please turn to your neighbor and share about loneliness and about God in our lives.